change behavior. And extinction, of course. The funny thing about extinction, you know that guy in the video who was ignoring the child and the child would run to the other room and cry and would run to the other room? Well, he was ignoring. That's what he was doing. He was, extinct he was putting the behavior on extinction or ignoring. But why was the child still tantruming or screaming and throwing himself? That's called an extinction burst, which is what happens in the beginning of extinction. So in other words, you, you scream and cry, and a child, and, and you ignore the child. The child is screaming and crying, and you ignore the child. From the child's perspective, what do you think is happening? The child's thinking, wait a minute, up till now, exactly, up till now, I've been crying and I've gotten whatever I want. What's going on now? I'm going to scream louder, I'm going to hit, I'm going to throw stuff, I'm going to give them a major, major tantrum to get what I want now. And then over time, if the child realizes you're not going to react, then the behavior goes down, okay? And it actually goes away and extinguishes, but it does have a burst. So, rule number one, identify your child's reinforcers. Do you guys really know, can you identify, like sometimes when I do intakes, I, I see new patients all the time. When I do intakes, I ask parents, do you know what your child's reinforcers are? And I, a lot of times people say, my child doesn't have any reinforcers. There's nothing that he's interested in, really. He, and that is just impossible, first of all. And secondly, if you can't identify your child's reinforcers, you can't do manipulation of behavior. You cannot manipulate behavior because you have no power. You have no power, okay? And if you don't know and your child is non-vocal and you can't guess, then what you do is called a preference assessment where you place objects out in front of your child and actually see which one he grabs, okay? And that's how you tell that's his reinforcement. And so there's, there are some things that your child wants and some things that he wants to avoid. You need to list those, literally list them because, and change that list often, add to it. And I'm not saying make those things avo available to your child all the time. Just make a master list which changes, right? Because when your child's two, they're going to prefer some things. When they're three, they're going to prefer other things. When they're four, they're going to prefer other things. But make sure you know all the time because you want to be able to vary those things. If you always think, okay, he wants videos. I'm going to give him a video as a reinforcer. Then what's going to happen over time is your, your child's going to become like addicted to watching videos. But if you have a whole array of reinforcers written out, you can select, you can pick and choose. This is very meaningful, that's less meaningful to him, this is what he wants at night, this is what he wants at day. Identify reinforcers, that's number one, key. And think about this. This is something I've kind of learned in my own life. Think about if it's okay to double up in reinforcers on days that are hard for your kids. This is what I do. When I, I travel a lot, I have three kids. They're aged five, eight, and 11. And I travel a lot because I do a ton of these conferences. And so when I travel, typically my youngest, my five-year-old, who is really God's answer to, you thought you were a behaviorist? Here you go. Uh, that's my Charlie. But when I travel, I worry about her because she has a real hard time understanding that I'm going to be gone for like three days or five days or whatever it is and I'll be back. And it's negative. It's not a positive thing. It's a negative consequence for my kids that I'm not there. So one of the things I do is every time I go, I hang on the wall three bags, like I'm going to be gone three nights for this conference. So I hang three bags that are, have a toy for each child in there or a toy or a clothing or whatever for each child in there. And first of all, it gives them a visual cue of how many nights I'm gonna be gone, especially for the five-year-old. And then they get a positive. They open it up every night and they see something really cool in there. And so my son actually, the middle one who's a son, now says to me, when's your next trip? Because he wants toys. So that's good, it worked. It's more positive. Oh, this is just one of those videos that I had to throw in there. This is a, a cute one with um, this kid where she really likes pizza. But listen to, just listen to the video. It's a cute video. Pizza's coming. <laughs> yeah, pizza's going to be here really quick, honey. Pizza's coming. Pizza's coming. 
What are you saying? Yay, right? What are we having for dinner? Chicken. <laughs> so she was screaming pizza, pizza, and Dad said, what are we having for dinner? And she said, chicken. It's kind of cute. So we talked about reinforcers, which are the consequence, right? And how they impact behavior and how you can change that in order to increase or decrease behavior. But antecedents also control our behavior, which is what happens before the behavior. Antecedents are very powerful because they help us predict when we will get good stuff and avoid bad stuff, okay? So for instance, going, you go to the doctor's office and you get the methyl B12 shot and you experience pain. And the association, because pain is a bad thing, by association, the doctor's office becomes a bad thing. Right? It's the association between the consequence that gives power to the antecedent. So, you can't avoid the consequence, but what you can do is you can change some factors, you can improve the antecedent. So, for instance, you know, at some of the doctor's offices, they give you a video. Nowadays, when you go to the doctor's office, it's like, I take my kids to the pediatrician, it's unbelievable. I don't know how it is in Canada here. You guys, do you have like socialized medicine or something? Yeah, you do. Okay, so it's probably not as nice. But <laughs> in the U.S., you go to the pediatrician's office and um, like the entire office is painted like an aquarium and there's like f cool mirrors all over the place. The kids are like excited to go to the pediatrician's office even though they're going to get shots perhaps or <laughs> something else. So they make it very positive now for kids to come in, whereas when I was a kid, you'd go into the office, it was like a horrible, sterile place that looked like a hospital. Is that what it's like here? Oh, you have pretty pediatrician's offices too? Or for example, after you have a visit with a doctor, like give the child a lollipop or something. I do with my kids, I always take them to the shop downstairs so that they can go shopping. Now they're very excited about that. Okay. Some ABA terms for changing antecedents or consequences. These are some terms that you might have heard, like enriched environment, shaping, chaining, stimulus fading. DRA, DRO, DRI, all these types of terminology. And I'm going to try and talk about a few of these because this, these are the techniques. But you'll see as I define these that it's really all about giving or taking reinforcement. That's really all it is. Enriched environment is what I was talking about, which is, you know, make the antecedents to the behavior cool. Make it a nice place to be. Watch a favorite TV show while you're doing... Uh, IV treatments or feeding problems or whatever it is, make it more positive. Put an iPod on. Like a lot of times, um, this is one of the, it's not really a feeding or biomedical issue, but this is a good example. A lot of our, when do you use your iPods? When do you, for those of you who have iPods or MP3 players, what are some times that you use your iPods? You use it to relax, right, most of the time. And we, ne we don't really think about these things, but with our kids or teenagers, music and that sort of thing is a very calming thing as a whole, and it makes a positive reinforcement type of atmosphere for them all the time. I actually use MP3 players a lot for our teenage kids, because our program goes up to 21, for our teenagers who have problems in school, who have social anxiety, I teach them to like put in an iPod because that really helps them feel more secure about themselves. Or here are some other examples of things that are enriched environment or basically changing the environment so it's more positive for our kids. Give clear and concise instructions. If you take one shot, you get to watch whatever it is. If you take one spoon of this, you get a lollipop. When the timer rings, you will get the, the candy or whatever it is. Be clear in your instructions. That's the only point to this slide. Now, shaping and chaining is this process where you reinforce behaviors that are closer and closer to the behavior you want. So, for instance, you want to get your child to go to the doctor's office and get a shot. What you do is you drive over to the doctor's office and you gave your child a reinforcer for just that. 
Okay. Next time you'll drive over to the office and actually maybe go in and give the reinforcer for that. Next time you'll, so you'll shape the behavior. You will gradually require more and more. I'm going to talk a lot about shaping and chaining because that's something you can use your, in everything. And with feeding, what we do is we have the spoon and I'll show you some video footage of feeding training that we've done. But you place the spoon, you just hold it there for a few seconds. You gradually increase the, it decrease the distance, so you put the spoon closer and closer to the child, and you hold it for longer periods of time. And you're also shaping the form of the food. You're what's called stimulus fading. The food starts out with a very like baby uh, food texture and gradually becomes harder and harder. I'm going to talk about feeding in a little bit too. Same thing with chaining. You break down the behavior and you reinforce pieces of it, okay? So for instance, you reinforce just getting out of the car. You give your child a lot of praise and that's all you do that day. Or you reinforce walking to the doctor's office and you give a lot of praise for that and that's all you do that day. And you, you reinforce putting your sleeves up or whatever. You break the behavior into little pieces and you reinforce those and then you do the whole, whole um, chain of behaviors together.